So now everyone is here. Um, hopefully um, you're okay, Brian. You managed to find us all right. I'll just check that. Yes. If you want to unmute yourself, uh, feel free to say hello. I can see Brian up there. Great. Um, now um, all of our speakers are here. I think what we'll do is we'll actually start talking a bit about the Micro Arts Collection. So as I mentioned, it's the first collection that we've acquired since we set up the um, um, CAS 50 collection, the name that we've given to the original works collected for the CAS archive. Um, and I find it very interesting because it's actually from an era where personally my sort of computer um, baptism happened in, in the 1980s. So I was using computers like, well, first of all, the Commodore PET, but then the ZX80, ZX Spectrum, BBC Micro and so on. Um, and when Jeff, um, I think we met at one of the CAS events, when Jeff, Jeff introduced me to um, the work that he'd done, it really rang a bell. It sort of resonated with me as an important time and something that I felt had been underdocumented in many respects and needed to be part of the Computer Arts Archive project. So I'm going to flip over to web browser. And show you our website, which you will find on computerartsarchive.com. And what you see on here is I've actually focused quite a bit on the new collection, the micro arts, to the extent that we haven't got all of the original work over from the first phase of collecting, but that will happen soon. And if we go into the collections, you'll see the CAS 50 collection. At the moment, it gives you an idea of what's in here, but we don't yet have all the artist descriptions. If there are any of the artists watching, remember to um, give me updated details and I'll migrate all of your material over. And this has had a number of exhibitions, including event two last year, where we um, pre presented the entire collection um, for the first time. It had previously only been presented in partial um, collection exhibitions. Um, and actually this has been expanding a little bit and we have some new work already in the collection and there are another eight artists I'm talking to about donating work but I'm not going to focus on that today. We can look at, uh, I could do another presentation about the new work in the collection at some point soon. Um, but we have work by Howard Cohen which is fantastic. I think many of you will know him. But importantly we have the Micro Arts Collection. And I'm going to hand you over to Jeff shortly, but Jeff Davis instigated this project and programmed it. And we have information about what he was aiming to do, the cassettes that he released. See these here. And that was the only way of distributing computer content, digital content at the time. And of course they were audio cassettes and the recording was very similar to the sound of modems, ones and zeros being encoded um, as, as tones. We have information about the magazine. Um, Jeff produced an issue of the magazine. The full magazine is here to download. And then we have something here, the move over to Prestel. And hopefully Jeff will say a little bit about this in his talk, but this is an area of the collection that I would like to explore a bit further because this Prestel system, there were similar systems all over the, um, the world. Um, some were very successful in France, the system was very successful. In the UK, it was moderately successful, but um, these systems were the precursor to the World Wide Web. Um, they ran over telephone connections, they had servers, um, that were distributing effectively text-based information, but with a slightly expanded character set, so you could do graphics. And of course, that's where Jeff was able to explore the creative opportunities offered by the system. So we have background about the micro arts project, and then we have a series of example artworks. Now, this project is large, and this doesn't include everything, but I think this is a good representative sample and our hope is that we will be able to do a online or I should I say offline exhibition next summer. And we will look at featuring more of the work, but also we're looking for people who produced work at the time to make contributions as well. So we'll expand the micro arts 
um, collection to include additional work from the era if it's available. But I have to say, this is probably the biggest collection of 8-bit art um, from, from the 1980s that I've certainly come across in the UK, and I'll be interested to know if people have found <coughs> additional collections elsewhere. Of course, one of the issues at the time was that these cassette tapes were moderately fragile. If you ever remember cassette tapes for music, they didn't last forever. Um, and they haven't necessarily survived. Some people may have them in boxes in the loft, but very few people have recorded them and looked after them as if they were important artifacts, the, the important artifacts they are. So we're interested to know if we can find more cassette tapes with artworks on, um, but there may not be that many out there. So what I will do is I will very briefly show you a couple of the works. Let's go into this piece here. And of course, the computers at the time were incredibly low spec compared to um, what we have now. In fact, I, I've been doing some teaching recently with some um, undergrads and I showed them an Arduino computer, which was a microcontroller. It's used for often for um, um, hardware hacking projects. And I said, this little device here is more powerful than the first computer I ever used. And these ZX Spectrums, 8-bit computers, are similar sorts of powered com computers to modern day microcontrollers. In fact, lots of microcontrollers are much, much faster. And for a, a good number, a good variety of works, we have images and then we have a video. And I think this one actually has sound, which I do need to remove, but um, uh, most of them are without sound. And here you can see one of um, Jeff's generative pieces um, producing an interesting image. This runs for a while as a part of a series of them. Um, and if you're familiar with 8-bit computers, the, even the colors themselves will be familiar. The palettes were not huge. You often had to work with a predefined set of colors. You didn't, I mean, on some computers, didn't even have the ability to define your own. And so one thing that I always recognize within work from this era is the colors used, are the colors used. I think it's quite interesting. And I'll leave you to look through all the other pieces, but what you'll find in this collection is 12 artworks. Jeff produced a lot of them on the ZX Spectrum, but we also have work here from Martin Roots, who may be with us today, actually. Um, there might be time for questions. I'm just having a little look down here. I can see, yes, he is here. And this was produced on the BBC Micro. BBC Micro is a very important computer in the UK. Um, I remember using it at school. It was a it was a popular school computer, um, and it also was at the centre of an early computer industry in the UK, which has gone on to become um, the ARM processor. So this computer was made by Acorn, and Acorn was the original A in ARM, Acorn Risk Machines. Um, so there's a sort of heritage here this BBC Micro. And of course, Clive Sinclair, who made the Spectrum, was um, very important as well. Um, but the legacy of Clive Sinclair is, is more in the work that he did and the influence he had on people, whereas perhaps the legacy of the BBC Micro is that we are now using devices that are, in some sense, um, uh, the, the, I was going to say, not the ancestors, the opposite, the, the, the children of this early BBC Micro. So what I'd like to do now, having introduced a little bit about the collection, is maybe hand over to, oh, I'm just checking if Jeff's, yeah, Jeff, um, to Jeff. And um, if you're okay, would you like to? Um, uh, yeah, sure. And talk a bit about, the, about your own project. Okay, we will do. Um, are we gonna show it from the Computer Art Archive website? <laughs> you know, the I video tour? I'm happy to do that. Or um, if you have anything you want to show yourself, I, I can I can just drive through the Computer Arts website. It might be nice for you to switch your camera on um, and, oh, people, and camera perhaps talk a little bit. Well, actually, uh, my might... camera is on. I'm, I can see myself. Can anybody yeah, see me? I think I know what I've done. I've pinned this screen. Ah. I shall unpin myself. And then you can take over. So Jeff, so um, maybe tell us a little bit about the history, about the background of this project. Um, yeah, sure. Well, hello, everybody. Nice to see you again, some of you. Um, I think by well, the immediate history of this project, um, I did show a short, did do a short introduction in June. I think some of you might have seen that. 
Steve Bell was there, you know, a few people were around, so that was great. Um, and Sean's done a very good introduction, so thank you for that. Um, I'm really pleased to see Martin here, who I haven't seen for about a year. Uh, and we got his work in, so that's great, in the micro art selection. Um, of course, Martin was working with the BBC, and I think um, it's working on sound projects now, which is quite interesting. Um, so the general project, I think most of you probably weren't here actually in June, and Sean's intro is very good. Uh, so I go through, I've only got a few minutes, so I whiz through the background and kind of what we did and um, what happened at the time, and then maybe a brief bit about what we're doing now. Um, in the early days, I knew Martin from music scene in Sheffield, because we were both in Sheff Sheffield in the 70s. Um, and so we, you know, we hung out, whatever, and then kept in touch. And then when I started the micro arts operation in London, you know, I talked to Martin and he was working with the BBC already, I think, with graphics for the Hacienda nightclub in Manchester, quite famous, and the lead mill in Sheffield, also quite famous. So he was already working on things. So, and then I got together with some other people I knew, somebody in France and a bunch of people in London. So there was a whole range of people involved um, at the beginning and I sort of put the operation together. So it was an example of a kind of social club and we're all working on similar things. The person in uh, France, Michelle, was using a Quantal system. So she's not in the current show in the archive because it's not the kind of 8-bit stuff. Because, <clears throat> of course, interestingly, in the 80s, it went from 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit. I started working on mainframes and then Vaxes, Vax Minis, and various other minis in different parts of the... In France, I worked on an English mini, but I can't actually remember what it was. Um, they got me to work on it because I was English. So, anyway... Um, there were a lot of minis around and then it gradually shrunk down to the cheap computers people could use at home. There's a huge range of strange ones came out. Um, so, we, you know, I started the operation and it sort of, sort of grew in complexity as it went along, initially with these little cassettes. And I've only got one, actually. I've got the master tapes. I don't have any of the actual art ones, but I think Martin has got uh, all of them, actually. So that's pretty good. And then somebody in Bath has got the whole set. So, you know, they are out there. Um, and so we brought them out on cassettes and I advertised in the computer press and wrote to the computer press. And the National Computer Press were actually very positive about it, really. I mean, looking back, they, they were a bit, they were a bit sarcastic sometimes, like the bohemian art world has arrived in the normal, so-called world of computing. But it was all, you know, got reviewed quite well everywhere. Um, but it didn't enter the academic scene. So it never got sort of recorded anywhere. I mean, I'd been at university and I ended up doing an MA, but at that time I was just doing it as a community project in a similar way to London Video Arts and London Filmmakers Co-op, which I used to be quite heavily involved in, especially the film co-op at the time. So, um, I mean, Brian Reffin Smith might know about this because uh, David Larcher, who's a filmmaker, lives in Germany and he might know him possibly in the art world. Uh, but he used one of the micro arts sort of things in a, as a prop in a performance he did. So and we had a show at the London Filmmakers Co-op with a text generation piece I did in 1985. So it was kind of around and quite well known at the time. It wasn't really recorded until I applied to do some postgrad in computer art and resurrected it all. Right. So I you know, got an emulator, put it all online. And that's how I got to know Sean, because it became a, a sort of because of the Internet, it became public. So that's an interesting timeline in itself. Uh, so we had the th three different cassettes for art, two graphic ones, me and Martin, MA1, MA3. MA2, which is all, all these are in the archive. MA2 was a, put together by me, it's more conceptual work. There was a extremely slow program that took two years to finish, which no, I, didn't, I don't think anybody ever did that, but that was the idea. There was a, um, a sort of agit prop piece called the money work system which is about universal basic income, which is quite a trendy thing now. Uh, there was a thing called carry on computing, which was math art with things appearing on screen. So, and some one graphics piece. So we had a range of arts. And I was trying to curate a series of pieces that were all kind of, you know, sufficiently different rather than just only do one thing. 1985, I did a text generator, which was called story generator based around a short story which was about mad cow disease, which was a thing in the 80s and 90s, actually. Uh, and it was a fake or it was a fictional news story. And then it was generated again through the computer. 
So it was fake news back in that day, kind of, because it was fictional news um, about a cow, the original cow, the what's it called now? The number one cow that got the disease and then took its revenge on people by boiling somebody's head in a bucket. But anyway, uh, so kind of interesting story. So that was, and that's led on now kind of to what I'm doing at UAL, which is text generation and AI, you know, kind of long gap between the two, but anyway. Um, so that was the project. I mean, it, I think that's, there's a magazine, which I've got here, which was had art and um, quite a lot of interesting articles. Well, interesting to somebody, there were articles, this sort of thing, educational kind of idea. And that was given away free and it was for sale in art galleries through uh, Distributor Arts Express. Um, and I took a load around and, you know, whatever that was. And, and then the second edition never came out because I couldn't get advertising in it. So the whole thing sort of then when it went on to Prestal, which is what Sean mentioned. Now, Prestal was David Babsky was the editor at the time, and he was very positive about the whole online uh, thing. Unlike a lot of the people at uh, Prestal, who always tried to sell it and make a lot of cash out of it. So it was on Prestal for a few years. That went fairly well. But from my point of view, I was quite enjoying the physical side of it. You know, the fun of doing a, a big project. I mean, I forgot to mention in the last one, I did um, audio tapes and things in the 70s. This is a Sheffield live cassette with people like Cabaret Voltaire on it. I had loads of recordings of Human League and all these bands. And I was in a band in Sheffield. So I had a kind of indie background. Um, so it's quite natural to do a project like this. But the press style side, I think, Sean is talking about resurrecting it onto an emulator. Oh, I was going to save that. Yes, yeah, which is that. Oh, that. sorry. Sorry. Ooh. That's all right. No, that's fine. There's a little taster. So that's a little taster. Yeah. So that'd be fun to do it on some sort of system again. Um, and then I ended up working. I went abroad, you know, came, I, I, well, I did networking in the uh, Prudential immediately after. Uh, typical, you do a bit of art, you know, come in and out of commercial work, which people do in com computer graphics and art, I think. So I did some networking, went abroad, came back, got a job at Sheffield Art College. Um, uh, met up with Martin again and all my friends in Sheffield. That was fun. And I was more, more working with you know, students rather than doing my own stuff then. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's probably about it, I think. Anybody? Oh, yeah, a couple of things. I was talking to Harold Cohen at the time by letter, physical, you know, snail mail. And he told me that I lost them annoyingly. Uh, but he told me that the main thing about art is marketing. That's kind of all he said. He said, oh, that's the art, just say that, you know, don't, don't write an article about it. So it, that's an interesting thing because he's not re really seen as a commercial artist at all. You know, he was university based. He was a big painter before he became a, a computer artist and did loads of shows. As in, anyway, that's, that was his quote, you know, a focus on the marketing. And maybe if we carried on it, at the time, if I'd had the money to carry on, uh, we could have done, you know, bigger, more professional things like this which is organic art, William Latham, quite famous. This came out in the 90s sometime and has, you know, software on disk inside for running these sort of ambient graphics on the, on the computer. And he's still going, you know, still very interesting work at Goldsmiths. So as any, I mean, it's kind of, quick, it's difficult to go through it very quickly, but I think everything's on the archive now. You can just have a look. It's, Sean's done a great job putting it on there. And so if anybody's got any questions, you know, just either come back to Sean or me. I'll just send you, yeah, Jack, um, Can I just add to Jeff, um, in 1981, I was head of graphics in Newport with the task of introducing computers to um, a foreign um, place and foreign oh, people. Yeah. But um, they bought me a Hewlett Packard 19, uh, 9125 plot, computer and plotter. And it did um, one move a second, but it, it's similar to the sort of stuff you were talking about. And um, I was able to use it before I switched over to, um, to analog um, artworks. But it, it might be, I've got a original stuff of that. Oh, excellent. Yeah, very good. You um, should I, get in touch. Yeah. Jack, I think we do have a few plots from that device, actually. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It was quite a bit of it. It was immensely slow, though. It took about five hours to do a drawing. Mm. Yeah, we had a big we had a big plotter at Salter Lane in Sheffield because we had a 12 Apollo workstation system there with a big plotter. I can't remember. It might have been A1 or A0. It's huge. And the thing is, nobody ever used it. It cost a fortune. Mm. Um, I, we had, we had you, you know, Umatic and 
uh, single frame video editing with Seagull, which is also quite famous. Steve Bell's used that a lot. Peter Kuninos, who's now at Bournemouth, I think, still. So, yeah, I mean, that, that era had all sorts of strange things being used. Does anyone remember working in Octal? Um, <laughs> Octal. From, uh, well, actually, in Machine Code in 1981, because that was all, that, there was no, ma no manual with it. And I was jumping around when I realised that I could make the, the, the plotter move one step. Because yeah. Work out yeah but it, um, I'll, let, I'll let Sean know more detail. I think he probably already asked them. Well, this is really what I wanted to say before I introduce Brian to talk a bit more about um, work and things that are happening then is that this really is the start of something. So the Computer Arts Archive itself, every collection we have, we want to be a live collection. So um, it can be added to, be it by people reinterpreting the work or responding to it. But I think a project like this there will be work out there that we can include in the archive so to add to the micro arts collection but as i mentioned before I, I feel that a lot of it may it might be sitting in lofts but it may have been lost and it does require people to dig a bit deep to try and find it so that's why i think we were so lucky really to find jeff's project had survived um so yeah, well yeah. more or less intact the whole lot was there in a box you know just yeah. and um, the other thing I've been, sorry the one more thing about um the whole text teletext area is I discovered there's a system in Canada. I mean, there's Minitar, which was very good, very big in France and probably had artists. There was some guy who did some work in Brazil because it was sold around. Minitar was sold around the world, unlike Prestel, because it was a better system. But in Canada, they had a system called Teledon, and that's been resurrected under something called the Teledon Art Project. Mm. And they have a person. It's I've got it all in my timeline uh, in, I, on the Micro Arts website. Just Today, I launched the, um, a new timeline of the 1980s, and there's all sorts of things in there, but the Teledon art project's in there. I can't remember which year it started now, but that was uh, pre-80s and then carried on into the 80s, I think. But they, there were some people doing art, and mainly it was a service for farmers. because of the. You know. I think Graham has a question as well. Well, it's not so much a question. It's uh, way back, I got hold of a little box called a data harvest. And what the data harvest did was to take analog video and frame grab it into a BBC micro ah. in eight glorious colours. Mm. They weren't the right colours, but there were eight colours. Mm. I, I've got no idea if I could ever track any of it oh, down. Sorry, so is this it taking is the teletext off of video recordings? Yeah. Well, yeah. it, it looked just like that, but okay, yeah. uh, you, you could actually get a recognisable portrait of somebody mm. photographically okay. from it. But uh, um, I, I think what I'm saying is connected in that uh, many of these old VHS tapes, as well as recording whatever program it was that people were watching, they did also end up recording the teletext because the teletext was in some hidden lines at the top. Mm. So mm. it actually, if you were a digital archaeologist, digging out old VHSs would be an interesting way of finding information, hidden information from the time. Um, I but think you might need a, a, a <coughs> machine learning to do all that sort of work, I think. Just leave it running mm -hmm. on a millions of tapes or something and see what it gets. Yeah, that's right. So um, that's an introduction to MicroArts. Um, I don't know if Martin Roots, whose work is featured on the, um, in the collection, wanted to say anything about his work with the BBC Micro at the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, one of the reasons I actually got the BBC Micro is that at the time um, I was sort of wanting to, to buy a, 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 a micro and I kind of had a look at things. And at the time I thought it had the best graphics. Mm. Um, I was actually more interested, I sort of, I, did, I was, in, I, I, like Jeff, I was also in a band in Sheffield. There were quite a few people in bands in Sheffield. But it's, um, I got in, I sort of like got interested in doing graphics because at the time that the, the sort of like the doing sound on a microcomputer was, you know, apart from doing the blob bleeps and things like that, it wasn't really a, a, a goer. I did actually with a, a friend actually, um, we, uh, well, he did the electronics side. <coughs> you know, so we did a little sampler, but you could, you could only get about um, about a second of sound in. That was about it, basically. So it was a, it was a bit limited. But yeah, the BBC Micro was, um, I mean, it was quite uh, quite advanced in terms of graphics as far as micros went, which is what drew me to the idea of getting it. Um, and it had, 
what, what I really liked about it, it had some fantastic sort of like graphics. It, they, whoever did the graphics um, uh, stuff for the, for the BBC Basic was, was brilliant because there was some fantastic stuff you could do with it. If you look on the, the, the site, there's a, an animation that I did called, uh, I think it's called Runner on there. It, I had a couple of different names for it. At one stage, I used to call it Computer Locomotion, but because uh, it's actually based on a Moybridge, Edward Moybridge um, uh, photo series, which I then kind of painstakingly um, um, <laughs> copied using a tracing paper and then put it onto a <laughs> graph paper and got all the points and put put the data in. So it, but what you could do is because you could change the color palette and you could also do you, there was a, a, a thing that so you could XOR the whatever you were drawing you used that exclusive, it would do it an exclusive or. So you could actually, if you did it right, if you were using a 16 color palette, you could actually have four colors and animate it, which is what I used for that. It was, it was a fantastic machine uh, for its time, really. Um, at the moment, I'm playing around with, um, I'm trying to play around with, uh, strangely enough, I've got into trying, trying to teach myself Super Collider, and I, actually, I was actually doing, been doing a, a version of that <laughs> using Super Collider, which is a, a bit different, uh, different the way you do it, but it doesn't have that nice XOR bit, which I, and color palette changing, <laughs> which I, I thought was really, really neat. Um, also, the texture thing uses a, uh, uses that kind of XOR type thing to to mm. to create the patterns and, and things like that. So great. Well, but yeah, it was... and, um, I'm sure we'll actually um, when the, as this micro arts collection grows, I think we'll probably organize some more online events. So we'll give you some time to maybe um, if you wanted to prepare a presentation or something um, about, about your current work as well. And a, a really important thing about um, archives is I don't think archives are about dusty old things. They're, as much about new things as anything else. I don't mean, therefore, we're going to be collecting new things, but the influence mm. of the micro arts collection, you know, should be is one that I think even students today could um, could uh, make use of. And the idea of working with a constrained color palette, working with what the technology offers, the idea that the technology has an imprint. That, like I say, I, I look at the color palettes of some of those ZX Spectrum ones in particular, and I recognize the colors. Mm. There's an imprint of the technology on the artwork and of course that's still happening now it's just we're not so aware of it in five yeah, ten years I mean, time you'll look at a uh, virtual reality experience made for the oculus quest and you say oh it's got the quest colors in it and that sort of thing mm -hmm. so i think that's yeah, interesting. at the um ua out Campbell art college where i'm doing some research now there's a they've just got some raspberry pis in you know the mm. kind of, i haven't actually used one i bought one once and it stayed in the box so i sold yeah. it I never got around to doing it, but I think that's similar mm. uh, spec to this sort of old 8-bit stuff. I don't know sure, anything about the Raspberry Pi, apart from the fact that children use it a lot and it's used in schools. It's easy to use. So therefore, that could be an area, possibly. Well, that, I suppose that brings me on to what you were just alluding to, this idea of rebuilding a something that can play teletext. And um, I've been looking at the, uh, the format, if you like, of teletext pages, and they're quite, um, it's quite well defined. It's a proper defined, almost like, like HTML makes yeah, the web. Sure. There was an equivalent, sure. as it were, mm -hmm. um, that made teletext pages. And we could actually create a tool that allows you to interact with a set of teletext pages from a, a microcontroller. And then people could create modern day teletext pages, work with those same constraints. So color palettes and shapes and so on, but still try to be creative with the technology. Um, I say, I think that's valuable because sometimes when you're presented with fantastic current technology, you feel obliged to make the most fantastic images. And if it's not using all the latest tech, it's, it's not valuable in some way. I don't think that's the case. I think the ideas are more important. And if you're working with some constrained tech, you really got to be confident about your ideas in order to get them across. Well, I also found it interesting with micro is that you've got the whole computer in front of you. I was used to working on mainframe, a mainframe, writing code by hand, giving mm. it to data entry people, getting it back on paper, editing it. And eventually you end up on a monitor and the machine was like in a you know, temperature controlled room with all these people mm. in white coats. So you didn't really know what was going on, really. Whereas with the micro, you've got the whole thing there. 
uh, apart from the monitor maybe but yeah. you know the whole thing was right there so you you had to deal with it to get oh, yeah, that's right yeah so what yeah. i'd like to do next we'll come we have time for a chat afterwards i didn't want to take more than an hour of people's time but if some people want to stay around for a chat i'm happy to keep the session open afterwards but what i'd like to do next really is introduce you to brian reffin smith who i would describe as an artist and an author is that correct brian would you be happy with that yeah, and sure. um as, apart from being a great artist and somebody who I think you'll find very interesting when he talks about his artwork, Brian also wrote a lot of books in the 1980s that introduced people, people around the world, um, to computing and to programming. And I realised af only after meeting Brian that he'd actually written one of the books that I read to help me learn to program. Um, and I think if any of you were writing programmes in the 80s or 90s, you may well find the same, that you've read some of his early computer books. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Brian. We've talked a little bit about um, what he's going to raise, but it's going to be a surprise for me, I'm sure, as well as everyone else. <laughs> over to you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, good. Good. And I, I want to be able to share the screen and the host has disabled that for the moment. Could, could you let me share my screen? I will do if that works, because I got a, one or two trinkets to sort of show. So you should be able to do that now. Yeah. OK. Can you see a picture? No. Not yet. I can still see you. OK. Yeah. All right. Oh, that looks promising. Yeah, I see it now. That's good. Hmm. OK. That's so you can see, see it still. See your desktop. OK. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. OK, it's it's an in-between written in basic. Um, but it, it's kind of a metaphor. I mean, there's a there's a computer which gradually transforms into a vibrator, to be clear about it. Um, so it's sort of I was trying to mention whilst avoiding the kind of wanky part of, so, of some of the computer art stuff. Um, it was treated with watercolour. I, ha I have no pride about sort of shoving other um, media onto computer stuff as well. But I'll switch a lot off. It was basically just to see if the thing was working. I've also got a BBC emulator here, um, which might or might not work. So what I want to talk about is not so much um, really what I or other people were making in the 70s and 80s, but rather how I, ideas emerge like confetti from the use of microcomputers, such as the Research Machines 380Z, later on the Amiga 1000 and so on. Um, of course, things like the um, ZX80 or water, and especially the BBC Micro. I mean, as, as other people, as Sean and as other people said before, um, Jeff and, and Jack and people. The BBC was wonderful, wasn't it? It, it, it had got two analog joysticks and that you plug those into the back. Now, instead of the joysticks, you could shove um, a couple of wires and get people to hold them. Who, then the resistance between the wires would change just like the joystick was doing it. And, and so eight people or a hundred people could all hold hands and then the end people holding the wires. And you could do, you could read that as a joystick and therefore move anything around or make music, you know, try doing that today without buying a magic box or whatever. Of course you can do it, but you could do it in a second with, with, with the BBC. And I thought that was uh, really quite nice. Also the, the idea that things were slow and open, you could get in there, now things are instant and you do something, I don't mean it's instant writing a program, but, but, but the results are more or less instant. A plotter that took, I mean, you, you said before, somebody said before, it took five hours to do a drawing. I mean, luxury, you were lucky. Uh, we had things that, 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 I had a BBC hooked up to an A0 plotter and that took a week. Uh, for some drawings and you had to watch it and stay up during the night so that the pen wouldn't dry out and things. And if you use charcoal or a watercolour brush, of course, if the charcoal broke, you had to stop it and carry on, but you had to be there to do that, which was all a drag. But 
the nice thing about it was, again, you could get your hands in there. You could stop a process, change a variable, see what happened, use bugs to creatively. And it's so difficult, I think, to do that now. Um, in preparation for this, I was writing a piece of software um, on the BBC and it, it was running on the BBC emulator. I've got a BBC just behind me, but uh, Model B with a monitor, those lovely old monitors. Um, and you could control the speed of the thing. It said you want it in real time. In other words, how the BBC would have done it. And I was making a little animation and it was flying around extremely slowly. So I then changed the speed to 50 times normal speed, which of course for the Mac that I'm running the emulator on was nothing. And it went really nice and fast and it, and it animated well. Then I stopped it and I typed run again and it crashed, nothing happened at all because the bloody thing had speeded up the whole process. So when I typed R-U-N, it was scanning the keyboard about a million times a second and going for the run instead of just R-U-N. And so it crashed. So speeding things up, in other words, wasn't a very good idea. Next thing, in three years time, it's gonna be the 70th anniversary of what I and some other people define as the beginning of computer art. John Whitney Sr. in uh, 1953. 70 years of computer-based art. That's longer than conceptual art. It's longer than video art. It's longer than acrylic paint just about, and so on and so on. And people still think, especially some students and so on, still think that it was done about six years ago and anything 15 years ago or more is, is really not worth looking at. I've said it before, I've written it, and I'll say it again. The tragedy of most art is that it doesn't know its future. The tragedy of computer art is it doesn't know its past. And I think that the Computer Art Society and the Micro Arts Initiative and so on are really going to change that. that that's going to be great. Harold Cohen. Um, yeah, here's, here's a Harold Cohen. Uh, he came to the Royal College. I mean, I'm talking about John Whitney, who was using analog computers um, left over from the Second World War. But not so long after that, I mean, 20 something years after that, in the Royal College of Art Computing Studio, we'd got um, a touch screen. You could draw with your fingers on, on the screen, N not like a little trackpad or something, but a great big screen um, on, on an Altair computer, an old, old Altair thing. We had stuff like um, computer control plotter, projector, slide projector, graphics tablet, and so on. And um, of course, we were using email. We were, we were on the ARPANET, and, um, or DARPANET, as it should be called, really. Um, and Harold Cohen came when he had a show on at the tape. And um, he used a terminal in the, in the Royal College um, to address his computer in San Diego and made a picture, got Aaron to make a picture, or Shaman, I think it was, making a picture, and then downloaded it, and, and, and this is it. Um, the, the paper's fairly yellowish. Um, it's this way up, isn't it? It's rather difficult to see on my screen. Um, yellowish because it came out of an ammonia-based printer um, on like a photocopier in a way on the old Tektronics um, thing, it stank. Um, but it's still there. You have to keep it out the light because it goes yellow quite a lot. BBC software. Um, I, I wrote a thing called Jackson at the Royal College. Um, it was a basic, basic painting program, basic in a number of ways. But it had one or two, I think, relatively new ideas in that it could do tweening and you could grab a bit of the screen and use that as a paintbrush. Um, it could do limited animations and so on. And um, the, the, the government actually bought it and bought my first car ever, I think. Right. Can I ask you maybe if you're not using the screen share to yes. close that and then you could maybe show us the Howard Cohen drawing again so we can see it in a bit, a uh, bit more detail. Okay. Yeah. So, um, huh. how do I switch screen? I haven't got the big window open as soon as it's gone to screen share. If you put your cursor to the top, I think you should be able to stop sharing. Yeah, I haven't got the main 
window open. I've got all you down one side of the screen and a big thing in the middle that just says Zoom, but nothing I can... Um, okay, if you, can, you move your cursor to the That's... top or bottom, and I think you should have the... Can, maybe, can, can you forbid me to screen share for the moment? Maybe that'll switch <laughs> it off. Okay, maybe let's try that. Um, okay. I think I can. How about that? Yep. Ah, there we go. Okay. Can you see that now? Ah, yeah. Okay. Nice, right? Back a bit. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then out of Jackson, this uh, painting program, um, which was distributed in schools that had got the Research Machines 380Z, which is what it ran on. And, and I was invited to be um, partly uh, participate in and partly be a consultant to a thing that the BBC made called the Computer Program. Um, and in conjunction with that initiative, the BBC sort of computer educational thing, they brought out um, these things, which were on cassette, of course, uh, one called painting or one drawing. They wanted me to split up Jackson. I rewrote it for the BBC. This is all in basic, right? <laughs> it's not even machine code. Um, this was all in uh, basic and it, it ran on the BBC Micro, but they wanted it split up so that, well, basically they could sell two of them, which was a bit of a pity because with Jackson, it was all in one. You have the drawing stuff and the painting stuff in one thing, um, just to prove that it's the, the sort of real thing. It's a sort of, um, where are we? A set that you had to wind back with a pencil. Um, but I use the BBC quite often. Uh, I've got some discs for it, but I've also bought on eBay a, a cassette recorder. I would recommend strongly to anybody who cares to, to buy a BBC Model B on eBay. They're really quite cheap and you can do lovely things with them still. It's, it's, it's great. Um, can I share again, share screen? Um, I'll have to give you permissions again, that's fine. Okay. Okay, you should be all right now. Are you seeing that? Not yet. I think you are now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's that's people um, playing a, a game on a, a slightly later computer. But the point is that they're using um, eight keyboards and eight mice connected to an Amiga in those days. And it wasn't really well understood that you could connect more than one device to a computer. You, you, you could connect in some ways various cameras and digitizers. And here they're playing a, a car racing game. And what they're doing is moving their my, my, mice to control the speed and direction of a racing car. It's fairly basic stuff. But the computer didn't care and didn't know who was doing what. It just got the information from all the mice. So if I move to the left and you move to the right, the computer averaged them. It averaged eight people at once. Uh, I think you can only see seven there, but there were eight. And um, I thought this would be really chaotic and fun, um, but, but it wasn't because the average of seven or eight people's um, mice was sort of blur, just sort of nothing. So I got away from, from cooperative things and went down to just one or two people interacting um, with a computer and did something called cooperative drawing. Can you see that as well? Some kids mm -hmm. using a, the BBC. Um, what, what, what they're doing is they have the joysticks and they can basically guide a cursor around the screen. And again, if one person moves left, the other moves right, it stays in the middle. If one goes up and the other goes up, it zooms up and so on. It only left a trace on the screen if they pro both press their buttons. 
And as with most things, as I've said before about the Senster, for example, Edward Ignatovitz's thing, of course, the, the, the sculpture in his case was wonderful, but the most interesting thing was the behavior and the interactions of people watching it and calling for it to come to the volume um, and so on. And the nice thing about the, the everybody who watched the kids rather than what was on the screen. And that was only possible, your internet connection is unstable, it's saying, um, that was only possible because I mucked around with the analog inputs on, on the computer. And that was only possible because somebody made such a wonderful machine as the BBC Micro. What I'm trying to get at here is that ideas which maybe contain kernels of, con of conceptual art questions and political questions, what's interaction about, what should you be interacting with under what conditions and so on, would not have come out, at least in my work, and I'm sure in other, some other people's work anyway, had I not played around with things like BBC Micro and the 380Z. So, and, and, and I think this is so important um, to, to show that, or to state, that you need stuff like that again. Now, on one level, you can construct systems, artworks, whatever, that enable that. On another, you can buy an old computer and just do it, you know, and, and whatever, make videos of it. Um, or as you were saying, Brian, you can get a computer and emulate, um, and a great or, one is a Raspberry Pi. And you may not be a fan of emulators, I don't know. But no, so, I, I, I'm just saying I, I've, I've got a BBC emulator on here. Yeah, great. Um, and, and the BBC actually runs extremely well on the Raspberry Pi, so you can even yeah, get a BBC I case bet. for it if you want to uh, <laughs> have the full experience. This, this is a later version of some of that. Um, six people could address an, uh, an iMac, the old Bondi blue iMac, um, and they each had a keyboard and a mouse and they wrote a story together, but again, the computer didn't care who was writing. All it says, I've got a new was, I've got an input coming from this keyboard. Now there were six of them, but it only thought there was one. And if you put Photoshop or something on this, Photoshop one or two in those days, I guess, um, it was actually really interesting to see people using their mice. Somebody might select a color, somebody else was drawing at the same time. The, the cursor was going all over the place. Um, lovely stuff. I think. How long have we got? Another sort of five minutes? Well, five minutes, be okay? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just one or two uh, very simple works that sort of came out of ideas. Um, I had a dream, as they say, and I imagined a picture <clears throat> made of grains of sand in a sort of almost one dimensional, sorry, two dimensional tank of water. In other words, one with no depth, just imagine two sheets of glass together. And I imagined the picture to be made out of grains of sand and then gravity caused the grains of sand obviously to drop to the bottom of the tank. Um, now this was done on a BBC computer as well. I digitized an image of three people in it and then wrote some software, always in basic, that took every pixel, looked at what it could do about sinking and sunk it. And gradually over about a week, it will produce one of these images. These are plotted drawings. And the pictures gradually left their own space. Now this came out just partly because of a dream, but also because you could do it. You could just look at each pixel and say, is there a space underneath? And is there, if there is, drop it. Now the next one and so on and so on. If there isn't a space underneath it, how about a bit of molecular vibration? Let's just shove it, nudge it slightly down and left or down and right. Is there a space there? If not, you stay where you are because you must be resting on a sort of pinnacle. If, if you can go down, go down. So gradually, here are those same three figures at the bottom um, where they've left. Now they've lost scale, right? It looks like, I don't know, trees or old ruins from Bradgate Park in Leicester or something like that, um, with massive ghostly spaces. Unkind critics have said condoms, but anyway, ghostly spaces at the back. Um, 
this idea that things could leave their own space, again, would not have arisen, arisen had I not been able to play around with examining pixels and wondering what to do with them on, on the um, BBC. And here is, um, remember, remember him? This is the BBC computer program. And he was showing on the 380Z um, a bit of software that I wrote that, that did some in-betweening and they were sort of, this was quite um, innovative on such a computer in those days, I believe, anyway. Um, the idea of in-betweening then um, gave rise to the idea, if you can in-between one shape and, uh, to, where are we? to another shape, da, 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 it changes. Maybe you could do that with, I don't know, 3D shapes or music, sound. What would it be like to put a sound? Oh yeah, right, the BBC, the 380Z, and most certainly basic running on a, on a, on a Mac. Um, you can put in a tune represented by the duration and pitch of notes and treat it almost like an image and change it to another one. Now, that's weird. You know, you've got changing to and you cannot predict the results until you've done it. Now, the last thing I'll say is that having written a bit of software to, you can put me back again, Sean, please, if you would, by forbidding the sharing. Oh, stop share. Okay, there we are. Well, you managed to do it, okay. Yeah. Um, now, I just, I won't show any more pictures, but I just want to say that if you write something that changes A to B through some space, you can actually let it go out the other side. So imagine a circle changing into a triangle. The circle gradually, it's par parts of it go inwards and parts get elongated and you get a triangle, right? So you can imagine a tween going from a circle to a triangle. Or imagine now a triangle going the other way to a circle. You've got a triangle like this, and gradually the points go in, but the sides expand, and you've got a circle. Now, what happens if you carry on? You've got the idea of out-betweening, and out-betweening has stood me in good stead for about 35 years now. The idea that you can change something to something else, then keep the process going. So if you change a circle to a triangle, the circle gets more and more pointy, but its sides deflate. What happens as an out between? It keeps going. It gets ridiculously pointed and terribly anorexically thin. What happens if you do it with music? You get a super Beethoven or a super Tchaikovsky or something. You go from Frere Jacques to some other tune and it goes out and keeps going and you get crazy stuff. You can't do that without a microcomputer <laughs> playing around. I mean, you can, but you don't want to. Anyway, blah, blah. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think a few things for me that come out of that is that I think it validates this idea we have with putting micro arts into the collection that it is still relevant. There are plenty of things in there I think are relevant to artists now or programmers or people using computers. Um, but it's sort of, it's almost lost. I wouldn't say it is a completely lost era, but we need to be capturing more of this. And um, I, I'm looking forward to, as we develop this particular project within the archive, maybe we could look at bringing some of your work in um, and others here and others maybe who aren't here, maybe we'll have contributions as well. So um, like I mentioned, I'd like this to be very much an active archive. Let's try and expand the collection uh, Steve, I know Stephen Bell is here. Um, you've got some very interest. If you've still got it, great. But even if you haven't still got it, let's talk about it and capture the ideas about what was happening back then and so on. So this is our first sort of um, collection of work beyond the CAS50 collection. Um, it's being done under the auspices of the Computer Arts Society, but for a separate entity, the Computer Arts Archive. There are some good reasons for doing that, partly down to ownership and fundraising and things like that. So before I hand you over to um, Nick Lambert, who's chair of the Computer Arts Society, I might just mention fundraising in that this project 
we have a space and we have a few overheads and so on. And we are going to be looking for fundraising opportunities through grants and so on. But within the new website, we have a very exciting page called supporters. And if anybody is interested, I can hopefully go to that, um, in making a donation to the Computer Arts Archive, we're a very lean, no one gets paid, it's purely to cover our overheads, but you would be more than welcome to make a uh, small financial contribution. I really hate fundraising, but I felt I had to, um, to mention it. Um, so before, um, uh, well, our next speaker then will be a short talk from Nick Lambert, Chair of the Computer Arts Society. Um, very knowledgeable about all aspects of computer art. Um, and I look forward to hearing what you're gonna be talking about, Nick. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Just want to um, pick up there. I promise this is going to be pretty brief, actually. I, I think a lot of ground has been covered tonight. I don't want to keep people hanging on too long. Um, I think Brian made a really good point, actually, about uh, computer art perhaps not knowing so much about its past. As, and uh, I really think that that's something that we're trying to address here with the archive. I think that's, uh, and indeed cows itself, that um, increasingly it's become a um, place to look back at the evolution of these things. And um, certainly that's uh, anniversary that was mentioned about uh, Leposky and his uh, sort of very first works of essentially computer-based art, though they were done, done with an analog machine. Nonetheless, the um, you know the importance of that and this ongoing art form is uh, is, is uh, really sort of worth stressing. I'm just going to share a couple of things actually, if that's um, okay. Um, can you see my screen there? Yeah, that's fine. Should be a series of exhibitions. That's right. Just very quick sort of look back, I think, at 2018 and 19, just really some of the things that the um, that the uh, collection put on. I mean, starting off the Leicester, whoops, start, starting off the Leicester back in, whoops, where's it gone here? Uh, there. Um, yeah, starting off the show in Leicester, and then, of course, uh, Brighton as well. I think that was uh, very important to have it in Brighton. And then, of course, the VNA Digital Weekend. Um, and all the time, you can see there's an intersection of old and new. There's um, sort of this combination of the uh, the sort of early history with, um, indeed, very much up to date, uh, both hardware and artists very much working in the medium today. And I think that's something that needs to be encouraged, but also there... You can see all the uh, cast of characters involved in bringing the event to um, event together last year at the uh, Royal College of Art. And I think for you know all who were there would um, certainly support me in saying how successful it was in terms of, again, um, pulling together these different strands alongside um, Kaz and the collection. You've also got uh, Lumen and, of course, Flux as well. And um, the, you know, the combination of, of, of all those sort of strands made it uh, possible. But one thing I want to just pull the attention towards, and I think it's important in looking at the context and the history, is something I did for that um, event back in uh, back last year, and uh, that was the timeline of the Computer Arts Society. And I think as Brian was speaking, I was thinking, well, there was an importance here about uh, the themes. You can see it was quite a large panel because I tried to get as far as possible all the issues of page into one large panel um, at a scale that was readable so that if you walked up close enough, you could actually sort of have a squint at the uh, cover material and see what was being shown. But also what's interesting, I think, is that if you look at it from far away, you can actually, see, even from a, a non-detailed perspective through the uh, through the Zoom, you can actually see some patterns emerging. It's as if the, you know, certain years, certain things were grouped together, both sort of graphically, but also thematically as well. And I think something about the evolution of cows emerges as you step back and uh, have a chance to look at this thing. And I think that, um, you know, what one could do is not only, you can see these in more detail here. So, you know, I broke it down between the sort of foundational years, 68 through to um, about 1978. So I thought the first 10 years of cows sort of hung together in a particular way. Um, you can see there some of, the, some of the issues, especially some of the work that um, Gustav Metzger did as editor of uh, cows at the time. And of course, the sort of seminal early exhibitions like Event One and... Um, and, uh, and interact in, in Edinburgh and um, of course other things happening around it like um, the systems show and uh, control magazine of course and um, and and the uh, foundation of Leonardo as well in 1969 um, 
But the point is that that's in each year, and especially at that sort of the early times when there was so there was so much of a uh, sort of ferment of uh, ideas and concepts, I think that was really the time when you know you, a lot of strands began to appear, which perhaps wouldn't bear fruition until a lot later. And what I find is interesting is that in many ways, other people have said this too, but in many ways you can see that the early era was very much an era of mainframes, mini computers, and interestingly, CAS changes just about 1979, the format itself changes just on the cusp of the uh, sort of microcomputer revolution as, as home PCs, well, indeed, and the precursors to home PCs appeared. Um, and of course, graphic, computer graphics became more of an industry at that point. And of course, the other important thing, as I mentioned here, is that uh, all these pioneering computer art courses started to appear in places like the Slade and Middlesex and, and uh, Bournemouth and other places. And there's this sort of, uh, I think, the convergence here of the um, first generation of artists meeting, I think, new new technologies, newer artists who are starting to sort of get that uh, underway. And um, CAS, even though it kind of goes into a sort of a period after 86 of um, sort of uh, essential dormancy, but nonetheless, it sort of prefigures. I think this is the important thing. It prefigures quite a lot of trends and um, ideas that um, develop much later on. And then I think just as important on the page as well, and I don't seem to have had it in my slides. Nonetheless, this orange area here from 2004 to 2015, the importance of that is basically that um, that's the period when CAS gets resurrected, but also it's the network era. It's very much the era of, of the web, and it's very much the, the era of the archive being pulled back into the present. So I think the question for us all is how can those archives be mined and uh, utilized and brought to bear and developed in new ways? I think just having them as, as static things is, is good in itself. It's good to have a reference point. Obviously, that's what the V&A has done with the original collection that the Cash Project pulled together in, in, in 2004. But the thing is, how do we sort of take these, uh, these, these, these ideas forward? And I think two examples here, just to finish with that. On the one hand, you've got the evolution of new artists and artworks in the sort of context of CAS itself. And on the other side, represented here by the Senster in its new form in Poland, as, as it's been rebuilt at the AGH University in Krakow, you've got this idea of not only resurrecting, but also reinterpreting the past. And I think it's you know really important that so we understand the processes that go into rebuilding and remaking these these works of media-based art, which um, in many cases need a you know a sort of a, a very particular approach, not only to capture what they originally could do with the systems of the time, but also if it's need, if it's necessary to rebuild and retune and, and emulate or, or, or sort of redevelop those systems to also make them somehow authentic to what they were before as well. And that sort of very interesting question of what is authentic in terms of media art and how can you sort of make that sort of uh, case for authenticity, especially in the interaction or the response or the uh, development of, of, of uh, the, these, these uh, sort of reinterpretations. So yeah, I just wanted to leave that there. This idea that um, far from just being an exercise in, in, in collecting old things, this is actually more of a springboard to new ideas and that it also should be about sort of um, taking those ideas out of, out of their original uh, sort of um, time and uh, being able to sort of place them quite firmly in the present where I think they still have a role. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, well said. I um, completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, so just to finish off, and I say I can keep the Zoom open if there are some people who want to just have a general chat, um, although I do need to go and get some food fairly soon. Um, we are actually, even though this is an independent project and it's not a funded project at present, although we certainly hope to get funding, we have already had people approaching us about giving us additional materials and we're very much um, excited about some of these. So just recently, um, I see a uh, International Symposium of Electronic Arts has talk, has um, approached us about holding its physical archives. So ICEA has been running for, in fact, I think Sue Golifer is here. I don't know if she's still here, um, but I think it's been running for, is it almost 30 years now? It's been running for a long time. And adding those physical materials, I think, to um, the collection we have will be very interesting. And we can look for connections. We can find threads that may be... Um, link that with additional work. Um, we have um, the personal archive of Edward Inatovich, who created the Senster, a very important piece, and we'll be looking after that, uh, um, cataloguing it, 
um, and giving it a home. It may move elsewhere in the future, but for now, we think we can do a good job of looking after it. Um, and then there are other individuals who have already given us some materials, which is part of the archive. Roger Saunders, I think, is here, yes, gave us some very interesting materials from the early days of the Computer Arts Society, including some materials about a piece of work called Eco Game that George Malin and, and Kaz developed, um, including original software and so on. So I'm looking forward to getting that all catalogued and put into the archives and making as much of this available online as possible. Um, and Jack Tate, who's also here, has given us a nice collection of materials from his um, drawing machines. Um, and maybe there are other people here who, are, who would like to look at um, contributions as well. well so, I'd like to say something at that point. Just an interjection before I forget, and before everybody goes home or goes off to eat. Um, in the early 80s at Newport, mm. we pioneered the use of tape slide controlled, a computer controlled tape slide. And it was very successful in that we worked for, I got jobs from Inmos and SDC. And at that time, we earned 8,000 pounds in funds for the college, which we spent on computers. So it was very much um, an artwork and it's only been alluded to very briefly, but I think mm. it ought to be in the in the archive somewhere, even as a reference, because I don't have any mm. of the the programs. But they were at the time a stepping stone before we got coloured colour on computers. Yeah, and and actually, Eco Game um, was powered by similar technology. Computers were controlling slide players because of the lack of um, of graphics and projectors and so on. So that's interesting. And it'd be nice to know about technology. So there, there could be a whole bundle of additional things that we're not aware of that it would be interesting to document. Um, it will remain, the Computer Arts Archive, it will remain fully independent for at least two years as we start building up the collections and making sure the governance is in place. But a, a longer term hope really is to find a, a university to act as a partner who can give us space to ensure that the collection is maintained, but also to build relationships with museums and galleries. So it's seen as a resource that museums and galleries can dip into. So if people are putting together an exhibition about 1980s computer art or whatever, they can approach us and take the work on loan and so on to incorporate in exhibitions. So it's quite an exciting project. It's been a funny year. We had planned to launch it at EVA, but EVA in July. And now of course, um, almost six months later, we're still in lockdown in the UK. Um, However, I think it has given us a little bit of extra time to just work on some of the ideas surrounding what the project should do and who needs to be involved and so on. So I think we'll look at sort of hard launching it properly next year when the website's complete and we have additional materials. So I think you can, if you, if you do come to the EVA conference, you can um, next year, if assuming it's running again, um, and it has a fit in a physical form, we very much like to think that there'll be a good representation of work from the collection and perhaps we'll be able to announce additional projects as well fairly soon. Um, Sean, can, I just, mm. can I just add, yeah. if I may, mm. um, we're, because EVA is part of the Computer Arts Society, we are also on EVA's 30th year, planning to mm. archive papers and all the documents from EVA over the past 30 years into this particular archive. Mm. So it will not only be the artist's work and also, but also the academic research that has perhaps gone with it as well. And that's going to go into the same place. So and of course that then becomes a resource that PhD students can use, other people can use, and you know, we can find those interesting or lost connections, which as, as a curator is always the thing that I'm most interested in, not necessarily curating the obvious, but finding those hidden stories and making connections between things that initially you don't realise are connected. So I think it's an exciting opportunity there. The EVA archive, at the moment, I guess the main bit I have is a gigantic box of um, three and a half inch diskettes that Graham has um, offered to come up and copy onto more modern computers. I have some old computers that we can get them from. Um, plus, of course, we're going to have proceedings and things like that. But uh, and that's been put off as well because of COVID. But hopefully next year, Graham, you can um, come up and spend a a lovely few days copying stuff off of three and a half inch diskettes. Okay, so uh, I think for those who need to sort of shoot off and grab food or whatever, um, 
feel free to um, to do so. For people who wanted to just maybe just informally chat for a bit longer, um, I'm a, I'm feeling a bit hungry, but I reckon I could make twenty minutes before I pass out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anybody's got any questions about the whole, you know, the eighties stuff I did or uh, text generation or those sort of things, I'll hang around. Yeah, actually, I should mention, of course, uh, we've been talking about Eva and because this has gone to various email lists, not all of you may be aware that the Eva conference is currently running online. If you go to that page on the um, website that I mentioned on the um, Computer Arts Archive website, you can join the rest of the conference and it is free. So you can sit in on sessions you're interested in or all of them. We're trying to put everything up on YouTube um, so you'll be able to, to look at the stuff you missed today. Um, but maybe come along to Eva and we are going to give a little talk on Wednesday about the sort of history of CAS and archiving. I believe that's right, Nick. Well, at least I, I am. Maybe I'm going to use some of your notes, I think. Quite possibly, yes. Depends if I'm able to get away from other meetings, but I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there'll be another opportunity for us to talk a little bit about this. But um, yes, well, thank you very much for coming along and do have a look at the website and let us know what you think. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I have a quick question. question. Oh yeah, question. I, I missed. I missed the beginning of the talk. Uh, are you in touch at all with Oliver Grau and his archive of media? Are you working together, or these two separate streams? But I very everything that's done in the archive will be twice as good if it's done in collaboration with someone else. So it's really important to work with other people. And yes, I have emailed Oliver. Again, this was just before lockdown. We were going to make some things happen. I'll reconnect with him now that we're officially la launched. But of course, his project, I would say, is, is bigger and more um, comprehensive. But I think our advantage is that we can dig deep into the specific little hidden lost areas of, um, of computer arts history. Mm -hmm. Can I just say about the Isaiah archive, yeah. that they are the physical archives rather than the online archives, which is a totally different kind of scenario. OK. Mm. <laughs> Thank you all. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you, Bristol. Bye. Right. Brian, I thought you might recognise that from some years ago. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, yeah. a very good, very good read, even, even, even now, after all this time. There were a few good bits. It well, actually, I was going to mention that because there's an interview with Edward Ignatovitz in it, one with George Mallon. Uh, John Lansdowne, people like that. So if you get it, you can buy it on Amazon for about 2,000 quid, but you can yeah. buy it on eBay for about six months. I was say, Brian, it's, you know, they do. help me find a copy. That would be good. Okay. <laughs> Just send me a link if you find it um, mm. at a reasonable price on Amazon. Yeah. You, you, you can get it on eBay sometimes. Um, oh, okay. there's, there's this thing as well, which is the um, um, kids' book, not the one about basic, but but the, the introduction to computers. Um, and that, and that actually has a got quite a lot about creativity in it. Does that have so, Harold Cohen and um, the Sensor, I think, in it? It does. Yeah, Want to see that? Uh, nice where's Harold yeah. Cohen and Sensor? Um, um, there we are. Great, yeah. There's, there's Harold Cohen and the Sensor. Um, <laughs> we, we are actually collecting... And there's another picture of... Well, so, um, we have books and CD-ROMs of particular interest of mine. And um, I probably got uh, maybe a hundred or so books already in the sort of library. And when that has been indexed, I'll make that available online so people can see what we have. Yeah, good. I've got some books you can have, Sean, I think. Hmm. But um, I just did the timeline on the MicroArts website and the, the 1980 in the early years, uh, Catherine Mason was quite very helpful editing uh, the timeline and with a few, but this is her book, I don't know. Is it, Reversed, I think it might be. <laughs> I'm but, saying okay. So it's it's the right way around, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's the right way around. Okay, a yep. computer in the art room. Anyway, by Catherine Mason covers the seventies uh, through to the eighties. That's very good. Um, and this other one, which I'm sure you know about, Paul Brown's book. Mm. Oh yes. Yeah. Both these two are really good. I'd say everybody, maybe everybody should have a look at them if they can get them somewhere. Mm. Great. Mm -hmm. Paul Brown's and Catherine Mason's. So all this material, it'd be nice as we start collecting it in one place that we will allow people to come and visit. So if you want to spend a day at the archive, that can be arranged. Although the space is not gigantic. 
it's one of these chicken and eggs in order to um, get a bigger space we need to generate more interest in it and then we'll get a bigger space and so on um, but uh, we do have some good materials there Sean can I share something that Harold Cohen experienced back in the 80s mm he's -hmm. giving a lecture about all his work <laughs> very fine it was too is at Bristol and he made the statement rather unwisely in retrospect that all his works may say 10,000 of them were equally valid and an artist put his hand up and said he couldn't quite go along with that because he said I spend all my life trying to produce um, a good artwork and most of the time I fail. Um, what do you mm. think? And uh, Harold Cohen had the grace to say yes uh, maybe you've got something there I don't have an answer I'll get back to you but I think it's a philosophical thing for all computer artists or generative artists that they might fall into the trap of saying that if it's produced by a computer program that they're all equally valid and of course that makes the point that they're not and one final philosophical thing that i'm struggling with is sometimes i'll get an artwork and i look at it and i say i wouldn't have thought of that that's a bit like all cretans lie because if you said that i haven't thought about it then of course you have thought about it and then <laughs> But it's something for, um, I think, generative artists to ponder on until um, we get in the philosophical part of it and to start pondering on these questions about how we react and respond as viewers to a generative artworks. Mm. I, I agree. I mean, I'm working in generative art at UAL now with mainly text, but the way people use it, it seems to be they generate many versions multiple versions some are interesting some aren't and then you select and this is a fairly co common thing with even producing the spectrum work some of those algorithms are put together in basic with peaking and poking and so on that might not look very good so you abandon those and do a different mathematical mm -hmm. thing and so eventually you you work, work with it as a tool so in a way the computer isn't really creating it it's just setting off you are the human is still setting off the algorithms and setting off the processes and it might be a really big selection process going on. So it's a detective process that I'm interested in now in my research, more interested in the psychology of the, how the brain works and the mind works with subjective choice, um, because we all respond to things. And as I used to tell my students, if 50 people look at an artwork, they go away with 50 different interpretations, which is quite different from a design object. And that's, um, I think, an area that we don't always look at. We look at the way computer art and generative art is produced and the technical underpinnings. But what I think is getting more important is now is how the human being responds to an artwork and how they process it in their mind, particularly in respect of um, what I'm reading at the moment about quantum effects. And that has, a, I think, has a bearing, um, even as an ignorant artist and not a physicist, I think it's got something to say for us in the to do with um, randomness, chaos, and uh, and um, quantum effects. Yeah, I think that's right. And all of these things, the last two or three people have been saying, are art questions, aren't they? It isn't computer art questions; it's art questions. What we should be asking about any piece of mm -hmm. contemporary art. Yeah, you're right, and that's I so important. Yeah, I think as well. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, Brian's point that when you know your history, you know, the history of video art, the history of computing art, then the kind of tendency perhaps in uh, generative art and computer based arts to look at how something is made becomes also replaced about what you are making. And the focus becomes on the artistry, what mm. the intention of the work is. And then obviously you know, the how is all really completely key and part of that. But for me, that's the advance. When we know our history about it, then we move forward creatively. So that's, that was a really good point. I thought that Brian raised that. I, th I think we're sometimes too nice as well. Um, we, we tend to excuse people who make stuff that's basically graphic design or basically de decoration as if they were artists. Now, I'm, no one's saying, I'm certainly not saying that, that, that stuff which looks like decoration can't be art or graphic design can't be art, but it isn't per se, it isn't necessarily art. And there's so much, I mean, I've always said that 99% of computer art is complete bullshit. 
But that's okay because 99% of everything is completely, completely yeah. 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 And that, <laughs> We just and have to separate the good stuff out, you know. Yeah, and that's about knowing the language that you're using. And when you mm -hmm. understand the language that you're using, then you see the subtlety in it. And you can look at a set of pencil drawings. And I was looking at through a set of my own pencil drawings yesterday that have computational qualities, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But I could say out of these five drawings, one of them was art and the other three were a, a kind of run up. It was a bit kind of like a long jump. You could see that I'd done da, 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 but there I hit it and those weren't. And I think it's understanding the language. And of course, that's very familiar with the kind of traditional form. But the same applies, I think, wherever you may. There's no way that um, you can allow yourself to fall into the black hole of saying something isn't art or is art. But if you do that, you're in deep proverbial because mm -hmm. the minds in the world have never really worked out what it is. And I've given lectures and I do say that to people, if you say that something isn't art, that implies that you know what it is. And please share it with the rest of the world because none of the buggers mm -hmm. know it anyway. So it's a very dangerous- Well, I disagree story. with that. Hmm? <laughs> I would say at this point that Mike Hart's one was called Abstract Originals, but it was in quote marks for that very, that that reason really it was putting out abstract art but as background ambient images so you know was it was it even abstract art if it's computer generated or is it just mm -hmm. something else I'm, so, I'm moving, I'm moving the conversation a little, a little bit further because i know douglas Dob Dobbs is here and they've got the vna archive i just wondered what the uh, i was thinking about for sean um how how the differences between the vna archives and your computer art society Archives are. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Very good. I think the first, well, maybe Doug oh. might want to say something. Um, I think really I see us as um, potentially a feeder for other collections in that we're in the position of being able to collect and sort and preserve materials that might be lost otherwise. And then mm -hmm. perhaps at some point in the future, they go on to other galleries. What, of course, the Computer Arts Archive doesn't have are the resources of a gallery or an, a dedicated organization and so on. Maybe if in the future we move to a university, we'll be better resourced. But at the, in the short term, it's about collecting those things that might get lost if they weren't collected by somebody. So, so a mixture of things, um, you know, bits and pieces. I mean, I'm particularly uh, thinking about the actual physical um, prints that need to be kept in a kind of, I don't know, yeah. an environment to... <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean or um, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, this is Roger Wyatt. Uh, I'm coming in from New York. Hello, everyone. Hi, Roger. Uh, yeah. Does the uh, 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 does your organization's um, uh, brief or focus also take a look at the uh, uh, the conversation, if you will, between the tool makers uh, and the artists? You know, as um, you know, as I, I was kind of thinking about that period, you know, the um, uh, the seventies and the eighties, uh, you know, over here in the states, uh, uh, what was going on in SIGGRAPH, you know, which was the uh, uh, special interest group for uh, uh, for graphics in general, uh, you know, had a, a great uh, role to play, and then also the um, uh, very uh, uh, from the ground up, uh, you know, the development of uh, uh, the Amiga, uh, the uh, uh, the Atari, uh, and uh, the massive impact uh, that they had on uh, uh, a pretty big diffusion of uh, uh, computer uh, uh, computer art and uh, computer video, uh, you know, as uh, as well. Uh, does any of that um, uh, fall into what you collect or are you interested in that conversation uh, at all? Um, well, I can give you my uh, my opinion in that that um, if you like the story I'm interested in that, um, that micro arts is is part of is actually the stuff that didn't happen in those bigger institutions, be it research institutions mm -hmm. or um, um, universities and companies. It's what yes. people were doing with technology that was released not for that purpose they almost appropriate the technology and use it for something mm -hmm. it wasn't intentionally intended for so yeah. um, i don't think you would say that the zx spectrum was intended to be an art making mm -hmm. device 
but clearly creative people made art with it. And personally, that's the story I'm most. Yeah, interested. I'm thinking of. Uh, mm. Yes, uh, the um, uh, the experimental television center in uh, upstate New York, in the middle of nowhere, mm. uh, uh, would be a great example of that. They uh, uh, they would make their own video synthesizers. They would mm. adapt uh, equipment of all sorts, uh, and uh, uh, you know, for oh maybe thirty years, uh, you know, had a um, uh, a, a program where people were turning out uh, uh, through uh, uh, residencies uh, an amazing amount of uh, uh, video-based computer-generated imagery. Mm. Uh, maybe that would be a way to uh, put it uh, in a general sense. It sounds uh, like something we ought to be pointing people at, certainly. It's um, yeah. there connections there that we could make the most of. Yeah, I, I can send some contact information to Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, Really, yeah, I'll put yeah. it in the timeline. You know, we have I have a timeline on the website now. So gotcha. anything, new stuff is really good. Mm. And also there is a Facebook group as well, the Micro Arts Facebook group. And not everyone uses Facebook, but it might be a place where people who want to share thoughts and ideas can go and do that. Uh, Sean, I'd just like to defend for about two seconds the idea that one can indeed reject bad art. Um, <laughs> I know I no more want to um, have people portraying a load of nonsense as art than I want to speak to somebody who voted Brexit or for Trump. Everybody's got their fine opinion, but I'm not going to be too <laughs> nice to them. They've had it, and so are bad artists, or we never get anywhere. I'm oh, out yeah. of language tendency in that case. Well, everything, you know, if I put together with Jeff this collection or something else we're putting together, everything's curated. There's a decision about what's included. So I'm making a decision about what I think is good or bad or relevant. Um, you can't not good. do that. I, I can't look at everything and say it's equal. I make a judgment as an individual and everyone does that. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Well, um, thanks very much for participating. Um, who knows where this project will go. Um, so don't always expect everything to happen quickly. Like I say, we're not well resourced, but we're su we have sufficient resources to do the project. Um, I, when I put the CAS collection together initially and started to realize this thing had a bit of um, longevity to it, I thought it would probably take 10 years to do what, um, you know, to make it in something important. And I, I guess that means we're just two years in now. So there's a lot of work to be done. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you all very much. And do come along to Eva. Um, you can or watch, look at the um, videos on YouTube. Although I've just looked at today's YouTube videos. It's going to take me ages to upload them, but I'm going to do, I'm try and do it tonight. <laughs> all right. Mm. Great. Okay. And um, yeah, follow, join the archive mailing list or the Facebook group. And that's the best way to keep in touch with stuff. I'll be posting updates to the website. But um, if you want something in your inbox, join the mailing list. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Will do. Thanks, thanks Sean. Cheers, Sean. See you tomorrow. Cheers, Jeff Bryant. All the best. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Nice to see everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.